Hello and good evening. Um, welcome to the Autumn 2021 Open Lectures, brought to you by the University of York. I'm Dr Ruth Penfold Mounts from the Department of Sociology, and I'm here this evening in my role as a Senior Lecturer in Criminology and an academic with a research interest in crime and deviance, death studies, popular culture and celebrity. We are very pleased to be hosting this fascinating event and thank you all for joining us online this evening during what has been and continues to be a very challenging landscape for us all. There is a trigger warning for tonight's talk. Some of the material discussed may be disturbing, so please do make sure that you prioritise self-care as necessary. A few technical notes. Should you have any issues, such as a loss of Wi-Fi, you can rejoin the event using the original link. If you're watching live, you will be able to ask questions of our speaker during his talk. Uh, using the Q&A button on your screen, and we will take as many of those as we can at the end. Live captioning is available and it's switched on. If you'd like to switch them off, you can do so via the closed captions or live transcript button at the bottom of your screen. Please also remember that today's event is being recorded, so you will be able to watch again on YouTube in a few days time, and also share with friends and networks who may be interested. You can also use hashtag York Ideas to join in the conversation on Twitter. So without further ado, it's my pleasure to welcome our two speakers for this evening. Uh, Dr. Gwen Abshead trained at St. George's Hospital, the Institute of Psychiatry and the Institute of Group Analysis. She's published over a hundred academic works. She holds an MA in medical law and ethics, as well as an honorary doctorate from St. George's Hospital Medical School. And she's lectured widely, including as a visiting professor at Yale and as at Gresham College Professor of Psychiatry. In 2013, she was honored with the Royal College of Psychiatry's President's Medal. You can purchase uh, the bookplate copies of Gwen's book from Fox Lane Books Online, and you'll see the link appear in the chat box shortly. Joining Gwen and gu guiding tonight's discussion will be Dr. Mark Abshead. Uh, sorry, Dr. Mark Freeman. <laughs> sorry, got the wrong name there. <laughs> Sorry. As well as being an honorary visiting fellow here at York, Mark is a senior lecturer in the Centre for Psychiatry, Queen Mary University of London. He's worked in prisons and forensic mental health services for over 15 years as a researcher and clinician, including in high secure category A prison estates, which house some of the UK's most notorious and high risk criminals. He's been a consultant for BBC America's Killing Eve and an editor of the Journal of Forensic Psychiatry and Psychology, Anne is currently an advisor to the NHS England on services for men and women with a diagnosis of severe personality disorder. His most recent book, Making a Psychopath, is also available through Fox Lane Books, and the link will appear in the chat. So um, I'm going to welcome Mark and Gwen now, and I will be back after they've talked um, and there'll be questions from the audience. So thank you once again, uh, Gwen and Mark, for joining us. Thank you very much, Ruth. And Thank you so much to the University of York for having us, to giving us the opportunity to have a discussion, which is quite rare, actually, Gwen, because it's usually in a sort of more structured environment we'd be talking and we wouldn't have the opportunity to explore some of the, the ideas that we've been, I suppose, working on for probably tens, if not dozens of years in our professional lives, which is, is lovely. I, I think we've probably known each other about 10 years. I remember that it was probably at the end of the Dangerous and Severe Personality Disorder Programme, just as the Offender Personality Disorder Pathway was beginning to come together, that I first actually met you in person, obviously having known about your work for a lot longer than that. Um, and, and I think that's an interesting place for us to start, because the, the Dangerous and Severe Personality Disorder Programme was um, an initiative that tried to conjure a new kind of optimism about working with people for whom traditionally they'd been very limited uh, limited optimism, limited therapies, hope for, I guess, making people safer, much less giving them any chance of reaching a sort of inner peace or a, uh, maybe even, you know, treating them in, in, in a sort of medical sense of the word. Um, and what I what I really loved about your book was this, the, the way in which you, you particularly work in these ideas of hope, compassion, and an acknowledgement that whilst there is the capacity for cruelty in, in all of us and all people and the possibility of violence, um, that that doesn't necessarily mean that we should be defeatist or that we should be cowering in the face of that cruelty, that we should run away from engaging with people, I think particularly who can seem very, very unapproachable and difficult to engage with in the first instance. 
and I also it's also lovely to talk to a, another forensic psychotherapist because there aren't that many of you and I wondered if we could perhaps maybe start there because it's quite a specialized training pathway that you would have gone through to to get to where you are and I, not, not everybody I think would be familiar with that so maybe you could tell us a little bit about what the training pathway is to become a forensic psychotherapist as you currently are. Thank you, Mark. And yes, I, I absolutely share your, um, your sense of gratitude. It's a great pleasure to be here uh, at the University of York on this, uh, on this evening and to have a chance to talk with you and with other people. It is a great treat. Um, so to be a forensic psychotherapist, as you say, is a bit of a niche activity. And, um, and I started off training as a doctor. Um, and I guess, and that's quite important, I think, to me, because to train as a physician is very much about integrating lots of different um, aspects of mind and body simultaneously. Really good, the best doctors, I think, are able to look at people in the round and think about what else is going on, what you can't see, what are thinking about and about what's going on in different domains. So my medical training, uh, while at the beginning of my psychiatric career, I didn't think about it so much. Lat latterly, I find my medical identity is really important to me. So I trained as a doctor and then trained as a psychiatrist. And actually, um, when I became a psychiatrist, I was particularly interested in the law. I got interested in the ethical issues that came up in medicine, in medicine in general, but psychiatry in particular. And I went off and did a master's degree in medical law and ethics at King's, which was great. I was actually taught law by Professor Sir Ian Kennedy, who was a fantastic teacher, very provocative, very interesting man. Um, and he was a great teacher. And I became really interested in those ethical issues that come up in forensic psychiatry, like the most obvious things is how do you find somebody responsible? What is being responsible mean and if you had a mental illness at the time that you did something horrible how does that make you less responsible how do we think about that so and that was really the intellectual path that took me to forensic psychiatry I was really interested in in how that was going to work from a legal and philosophical view but it was and once I started working in forensic work I, I then realized very quickly that unless I trained as a psychotherapist I would never get to talk to patients <laughs> at all. Um, it's an unfortunate uh, effect. Of, it's not true of all psychiatrists by any means, but unfortunately there is a bit of a pressure and it's getting worse, I'm afraid, in the NHS to make psychiatrists almost the last people to talk to the patients and it, um, who need our help. And I, I very swiftly realised that if I didn't do something, I would be the only per I would end up leading a team where I was the only person who had never spoken to the patient for any length of time. So, um, and also philosophically, again, I was really happier just wanting to get alongside who this person was um, and wanting to go deeper, really. But this, this question that you and I have struggled with professionally uh, for a long time is, is you know, how does mental disorders of various sorts, how do they increase your risk for violence, if at all? Um, and, and if they do, even in a tiny way, explain your risk of violence, what does that mean for us as, as service providers and as therapists? So that was my journey, as it were, to training as a therapist. And just one final note was that I, Look, uh, I'm, I don't know how many people will know this, but there are many, many schools of psychological therapy that you can choose to do and pursue. But I chose group therapy, group analysis, because it seemed to me that the people I was working with had failed in some a very specific social way. There was an aspect of their social identity in the social world that excluded them that was important and interesting to me. So that was an important reason for why I wanted to train as a group analyst. And it still is a, a very important part of my, my work. Well, thank, thank you very much, Gwen. And my, I suppose my interest in forensic psychotherapy, as you talk about it, was 
I suppose I'm not a medic myself, I'm a psychologist, so I wouldn't have had the opportunity to follow the same pathway with a background in medicine as you. But what struck me about working with forensic psychotherapists in particularly the, the mental health system, and it might be interesting to come back to the difference mm. between prison and forensic mental health in mm. a moment, but just that forensic psychotherapists carry a lot in terms of helping people to think about terrible things, not necessarily doing that thinking for them, but providing a space we're thinking about people who not only have terrible narratives in their past, they may have committed an awful crime or, or some of the, the clients in prison and uh, forensic mental health services who committed crimes have such appalling histories of neglect, abuse and trauma that, that even getting to sort of getting past that for some people is going to be very, very difficult. But what I found really, I mean, I've worked with Clea Van Velsen for a long time, and what I found that she she brought to the team was sort of just a space to think about things that were unthinkable. And, and that that's a role that's sort of really, really valuable, because otherwise you, you, you seem to, or teams tend to get into a space where we throw medication at a problem, or we throw management at a problem, we, we feel like we should do something. So we set up a group that does something, but we don't really think about how that is going to work for that person in particular it's almost like we need a space or a framework and i don't think it matters what the framework is whether it's psychodynamic mm. psychoanalytic group analytic just so long as there is some sort of way of bringing together all the thinking in one place and i, I know that forensic psychotherapists were never particularly common but mm. a lot of a lot of you are retiring moving on um, mm. And, and I, it feels to me that there's a little bit of a danger of something getting lost in that. Mm. And I wondered if you had a bit of optimism about how either that, that sort of holding space might continue or mm. whether you thought the profession might be about to undergo a bit of a rebirth or if there was any hope for keeping it around. Well, it's so interesting that you asked that because one of the very first papers I ever wrote when I was a junior forensic psychiatrist was about forensic psychotherapists and whether they were a dying breed or an evolving species. And, um, and I tried to argue then that it was a kind of evolving species. Um, and, and that was at a time when in fact, there was a lot of interest in bringing forensic psychiatry and psychotherapy together. Um, and that trained a sort of crop of forensic psychotherapists, some of, and many of whom are still around. And I think there is still some interest in this. I think the downside is a, is a rather boring, arcane structural one, which is that um, trusts, uh, because, because NHS services are now run by businesses, they attempt to cut costs by getting rid of expensive staff and psychiatrists are seen as expensive. So psychiatrists who are also trained as therapists are seen as, well, we don't really need that. We could have other people who are not medically trained and less expensive. We could have them working as therapists. So we don't need that combination of medicine and therapy. And this really goes back to a very old argument and, and as old, certainly as old as Freud and possibly before, which is, 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 is of, of what added value is it to have people who, um, uh, who, are, who study the mind who also have a medical training? And, and uh, of course, I would argue that we need some. We don't need everybody <laughs> to be medically and psychologically trained, but we need some um, because it's helpful to have that kind of uh, bilingualism if you like, I think. Um, but I, and I hope, I, I, I am hopeful that we will be able to encourage some more forensic psychiatrists, maybe not to do some of the trainings that we used to do, but, but to, to carry on being interested in the psychological ways of thinking, um, which are, are so important, not only, I think, for looking at the unthinkable and the unspeakable, Mark, as you put it, but I think also in terms of trauma, you see, I, I mean, I uh, and responses to trauma and how minds develop. You see, I mean, I was very fortunate to, to work um, in two different trauma clinics and to work, including one trauma clinic at the Middlesex, which had a ch child trauma service attached to it. And from those people, I began to get a bit of an education about what trauma might do to the developing mind. And I think that it's those kind of ideas that are really important for trying to formulate how does this person's terrible history of abuse and neglect, how does it help us to understand how they might have got to a place where they could let themselves do something horrible. And in the book, what Eileen and I have tried to do is to set out this idea of a bicycle lock, mm. 
um, where there are a number of risk factors of which childhood trauma will only ever be one and won't be definitive, can't be definitive, but it might be in certain circumstances if other places are there, there might be something about unresolved childhood traumatic distress that, that was somehow contributed to the violence taking place. Absolutely. And I'm, you're, ans you're asking and answering my questions for me, which makes it my job wonderful, Gwen. Thank you so much. But the bicycle lock analogy you use, I think, is particularly powerful because it's suggesting that there are lots of different combinations of experiences that people may have, situations that they may be put in. But certain of these are going to lock into a combination that puts them in a space where violence is, is more likely. But there's lots and lots of research that helps us to think about that. Mm. The problem is the final code on the lock, I think. And this is something, you, again, your case studies really speak to. Like, what, how do we come to understand the final, the final code? What is it that puts somebody who's simply very risky into somebody who's going to commit quite a serious crime, probably a violent crime or a sexually violent crime? And, and that, we call, I suppose I call that a trigger, but, you know, the mm. final key in the lock, it, it doesn't mm. really matter. What we mm. do know is that the only way we can think about it is really with reference to the individual's specific mm. history and trait. Mm. There's no point trying to address this generically. Mm. I think partly because from a research perspective, the numbers of people you'd need to have sharing the same kind of personal characteristics. And it can be something as sort of mundane as a you know particular insult they heard in their childhood or exposure to a particular group of people that they're prejudiced against in some kind of bizarre way, or even, a, a, you know, an insult that's not intended as an insult. And I remember this very bizarre case of a, a man who was discharged from prison with a very specific crime in mind. He was going to kill his father-in-law. And then uh, on the way to, he went, got all the equipment to do it, went to, uh, met one of his friends coincidentally out of nowhere on the way to, to commit this crime and the friend talked him out of, of, of committing that particular crime he said you know it's a waste of time what's done is done you leave it in the past we'll move on let's go and have a drink and they had probably a few too many drinks and then walked home and at the end of that that sort of walk home just as they were going to part ways the friend said to him well you're a bit of a pussy that I talk you out of that or something to that effect and the the guy just picks up a brick he was so wounded by that you know that denigration of his manhood hit him over the head and killed him um, and then was tried and found guilty for murder so it was something really really specific that final lock and what i'm sort of curious about is what that last click of the lock might be and whether you think you know it's always helpful to think in that way with every every uh, uh, client that you have Yes, I do think it's I do think it's helpful, partly because I and I don't know what you think about this, but I do think the violence is quite an unusual way to break the criminal law. I mean, we know that if people are going to break the criminal law, they're more likely to to do commit something on a variation of taking other people's stuff. Um, so at, violence is a very particular way to break the law and to sort of sort of stake your claim as a kind of transgressor, as to make your mark, as a kind of communication. So I, I guess I've been very influenced um, by Lonnie Athens and the social construct constructivist kind of accounts where um, this idea about violence as a kind of communication, a transaction between people. But as you say, then the last number in the lock, the, lock, the act of violence represents a very particular communication to the victim, something in that interpersonal space happens. So, and the example you gave is a very painful, but a very familiar one, isn't it? Where the victim often gets the violence that's displaced from somebody else. And curiously, I had exactly the same experience with somebody, this is, uh, I was being told this story by somebody else, but again, about how somebody had displaced all their rage with person A onto person B who happened to be in the wrong place at the wrong time. And I think that that kind of uh, transaction, that kind of cruelty, um, I, think, I think we have to get up and get close to it and sit down and listen to what the person has to say. And that's why, again, creating these kinds of, of professionals, forensic psychotherapists, forensic psychologists, forensic, whoever they happen to be, but part of our job must be to sit down and make a space where a, an actor, a violent actor speaks, and we listen to what they have to say, and we listen with care to their exact language and the way they talk, because that might take us 
I hope, to that last number, which might help us to help us to understand how that happened and the way that it happened at that time, which has got to be relevant then to risk assessment for the future. That's the theory, isn't it? Absolutely. And I think there's something so important about this because there's, it's very easy to fall back on some very lazy narratives about why people commit horrible crimes that actually almost diminish their role in the offence and, and, and seek to engage the victim in it. And I, I was having a conversation with a, a, a female a forensic psychologist, uh, Kerry, Kerry Danes, about this, but the, the red mist defence, which is particularly used against men who are violent towards their partners, usually female, but not always. And, and sort of this idea that there's a defence there that I was provoked to the point where, you know, I just basically cognitively shut down. And how p particularly that, that defence has never been used by a woman until very recently actually there was a very recent case of a, uh, a woman who murdered her husband which I think is still on trial but that sort of elides the responsibility and the understanding of the perpetrator of what the, the bicycle lock mechanism is in that case it makes it very if, simp so, if we're saying somebody simply became overwhelmed by emotion um, then how how is it possible to understand the circumstances by which that would happen again we need much more of a nuanced understanding of that person and how these gears finally clicked up to, to mm. lead them to the point where they were going to commit the offense and also you know the danger of that narrative again as i was saying is that it allows some leeway or some um, special treatment for men who are provoked by women which wouldn't apply the other way around uh, and I think, you know, also particularly, you know, if there's any sort of controlling or uh, coercion or, or, or persecution going the other way, that always gets lost in the narrative as well. Yeah. And, and, and I think you're, you're right. What's so interesting, I think, uh, for those of us who are involved in this work is the is the appearance of these kind of stock narratives um, um, that are are really quite superficial and 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 of course we understand why people will will go for these narratives you know when it's when when my time comes to be charged with murder i guess I'm, you know I'll, I'll go for one too you know but but there is a kind of superficiality about them that invites um i i, I think invites a skeptical response just because it is such an odd thing to do to kill somebody then most people who are overwhelmed by emotion manage not to kill this other person. Uh, one of the ones that uh, we see a lot in, in, in the hospital is other, and you may, of course you'll see them in prison too, are the men who kill another man claiming that they made sexual advances to them. So they would claim either that the victim made sexual advances to them, or that the victim was in fact a well-known paedophile, or finally see that the victim reminded them of someone who had abused them when they were little. And of course, we have often have no evidence that this is any of this is true at all, either that they were abused or that this man came onto them. Or and but it, it's what I find very disturbing about this is the kind of idea that a if a man comes on to you, that's a kind of justification for killing them, um, which will be news to women um, across the world <laughs> historically. Um, and um, and um, but the other thing is that even if it were true that you were sexually abused, uh, but when you were a child, which is a, a, you know, a dreadful thing to happen, that the idea that that would somehow explain fatal violence later is a nonsense. Um, you know, our yeah. best guess is that about between eight and 12 percent of the population have experienced sexual abuse and they're not we don't have those numbers of people killing people. So, you know, it doesn't exactly. make any sense. And it's something it's something about standing up for the complexity of these of these kinds of homicidal narrative. And, it's and we see it particularly in homicide. I think that's not in so much. I don't I'm not so sure about rape. Rape is something different. But mm. but with homicide, I think you see these kinds of narratives that are crude. I think, in my view, that I, I think we're going to leave the questions mostly to the end. But there is a question that's that's been submitted that actually is one that I had in mind when I heard you speak uh, previously about the sort of the, the, the locks and the bicycle lock as, as being sort of providing more and more stress, put, putting people under more and more stress, making it more difficult for them to sort of reason through their actions and putting them more in a, a sort of a place where they're likely to do something more extreme more cruel if you like and and there's a criminological theory i think it, the, the diathesis stress model that suggests that that 
that's something true as well. And I wondered if you if you've been uh, influenced by that theory at all, or you thought it still had merit, or if there are any problems with it. Well, no, I know. I, I mean, I think it's, and of course, it's a model that we see in psychology as well about mental illness. I mean, the, the, I mean that that model that the more stress you put on people, eventually they get to a point where they, as it were, drop off a, an edge into mm. something which is categorically different from where they were before. So I think that, and I think those kinds, of, and I like those kinds of model. I think because they are dynamic in the proper sense of the word, in that they refer to the mind as something that is constantly in motion, um, and that we're always moving on dimensions or spectra or it seems to me that what we know about the mind and the brain suggests very strongly that it is nothing like a electrical keyboard um, but it is you know that wave dynamics are much more likely and, and uh, in terms of the physics of it and what so what you've got is constant movement along different dimensions that are operating and quite how they manifest this whole other ball game but but I, I guess the other thing that I would add to this is and something I've been became much more interested in the last 10 years or so is something about if that's true that there's a dimensional aspect to all sorts of aspects of our mental function and brain function is there one for reality distortion because I find myself wondering whether both the stress diathesis model and indeed the bicycle lock which is analogous in some in many ways I think is the idea that the more of these things open the more you get pushed into a kind of a reality distorting state of mind where actually your grasp on what is real and what is fantasy um, that that ability to distinguish those begins to get thinner and thinner and I think in those states of mind, it is possible for very strange, very cruel, very violent things uh, to happen. Um, and of course, we see those particularly in high secure hospitals because we still admit preferentially people who do very weird and nasty things. Um, there's something about a sort of ick factor that gets you admitted straight to a psychiatric hospital in a way um, which is, a, I think, a bit peculiar. Well, I think some of your colleagues would be quite open about that. You know, they, they would be loath to recommend a transfer to somewhere like Broadmoor or Rampton unless there was something, you know, interesting, icky almost about it. Some of them would actually say that. I, I can not going to name them, but I could certainly. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Who would yes. say, you know, you know, yeah. you know and things like morbid jealousy, erotomania, fixation, uh, particular kinds of paraphilia, mm. were, were, you know, without that sort of plus factor there wouldn't be enough to justify the extra care that a high secure bed mm. uh, offers. And I think just, just to sort of say for the audience's benefit, there's a huge difference in terms of the resources you need, mm. even to put someone in a category A prison, which I think could run you up to 80,000 a year compared to a high secure hospital. You're looking more in the region, I think today of three to 400,000 pounds a year. Yes. So a factor of five, possibly yeah. more times uh, because of the, what you were talking about earlier, Gwen, actually the, the expense required to have, forensic psychiatrists and other professionals who are trained to the point where they can deal with the kind of risk and, and also distress that people in the high secure estate would would prompt. Mm. I think that's really, and, and of course it raises a fascinating ethical issue about if you are going to invest huge amounts of resources in some people, who are you going to res who are you going to invest them on? Do you invest it in people who in fact will never ever leave secure conditions or do you invest it in people who have a fighting chance perhaps because they're not grossly antisocial perhaps because they did have some kind of catastrophic sort of unicorn type of um, offense for want of a better phrase kind of black swan kind of thing where you might think that they've got a fighting chance of making progress I'm thinking of a man this is many many years ago um, I can't and I don't I don't remember the details um, but I do remember that he he developed a manic illness um, and he became acutely manic and sort of ran amok in his local Sainsbury's and killed three people horrible horrible offense um, um, but clearly clearly mentally ill grossly mentally ill nobody disputed he was mentally ill and didn't have any previous history didn't um, wasn't known to services came into the hospital got better very quickly and was then very distressed at what he'd done and an awful awful thing and was going to need long-term rehabilitation because couldn't couldn't go home and, and all that sort of stuff now you might argue that he's a kind of paradigm case for the high secure services to work with where you've got a fighting chance of rehabilitating someone like that 
and um, but they've done something which is in a very high profile, very scary, very disturbing. Whereas we do have, and you know as well as I do, and particularly in a high secure prison estate, we have some extremely disturbed individuals who are who are probably never going to leave custody or very unlikely to, um, who are often very disturbed and need a lot of support to continue living. Um, to keep it keeping them alive. Well, I, I very sadly, I was going to tell you the opposite story, which was a, a man who was a school teacher, respected school teacher, and just became acutely paranoid. So acutely paranoid that he was convinced that people on the street were following him, went into a hardware store and bought a, a saw or a knife and just randomly st stabbed away at two people completely unknown to him and killed one of them, severely injured the other and was sent to prison because the reasoning was that he had a personality disorder. I'm going to, I think I'm going to ask you a proper question about this in a moment, but that, that man clearly when he came into prison was very, he was both still suffering from, I suppose, a reality distortion and also clearly very, very traumatized by his crimes and prison was in, in no way the right place for him. But I think because we offered some sort of mental health service within the, the Dangerous and Severe Personality Disorder program, that was seen as the only place in the prison to put him without sending him to, uh, you know, the very scarce resources of a uh, mm. prison hospital bed, where it's still not likely he'd have received the treatment that he needed, but at least there was more chance perhaps of him seeing a psychiatrist uh, with us than on the main wing. But that was a very uh, and it's not the only story I could tell about that. It just seemed to be the most particularly tragic one where clearly this person was in the wrong place. And I was actually it, it prompted to think about by a, a, a case early in your book where there's a, a, a very vulnerable young man who is assessed by a number of different psychiatrists, including yourself. And the majority of the psychiatric opinion that's given to the judge suggests, you know, he, he's clearly mentally unwell and he needs help. And then one dissenting opinion by another psychiatrist is given that he's, a, I think, a psychopath. I think that was the actual opinion that was given. And in the judge's eyes, this term psychopath, which I, I think, you know, maybe we could talk a bit about more that, about that if we have the time, because it's much more ambiguous than that. Mm. But in this case, it's taken to mean you're not mad, you're bad. And mm. therefore, this vulnerable young man is sent to prison, given a prison sentence, which is probably very, very unhelpful for him. Um, and it's, it's it really sort of shocked me in a way that, there can be a balance of opinion towards one narrative, particularly one that offers support, but that the judge can throw out the weight of opinion and simply go with the narrative that's maybe more convenient for their perhaps social or political perception of a particular crime. And I just, uh, yeah, I yeah. I don't know if you, were, you, I'm sure you know the case that I'm talking about, but I wondered how, how it was for you feeling that, you know, quite a robust decision and piece of advice had been given to the court that was simply neglected or cast aside because somebody invoked the, the magical psychopath trigger well um and of course in homicide cases you're talking about a jury um so you know the i mean judges will give directions and so forth but the jury has the evidence and often it's the jury who will um who will you know Get, we'll, we'll, we'll hear that magic word and 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 as you say mark we could easily have an entire lecture just about the concept of psychopathy and how it's been taken up particularly in the last 20 years and the kind of folk psychology public discourse um and misused grossly misused I, I i think in a way which is not helpful um and it is very interesting to me how the zeitgeist has changed because i i'm old enough to remember when anybody who had killed in odd circumstances and where there was some question about their mental health would come to a psychiatric hospital whereas now the numbers of people who run successfully run a psychiatric defense has dropped dramatically um, and even people who've got very well established histories of mental health problems um, and uh, will not necessarily uh, get a manslaughter on the grounds of diminished responsibility get sent to hospital even just because at the very moment of the killing somebody thinks that they were coherent 
and had intended to do what they wanted to do. But that, of course, is not an argument <laughs> against being mentally unwell. Um, and also, there's, it's just about the other thing about is about the cumulative process. If you're, if you're seriously mentally unwell for a number of years, the idea that you might have a coherent moment for which you're going to be responsible, whereas all the rest of the last five years you've been, you've been seriously you know, uh, you know, handicapped or disabled by your mental state is a nonsense. But I think it's partly because we live in this very odd zeitgeist where we are not so interested in treating people. We're quite interested in housing people to stop them from being dangerous, but we're not very interested in treating people. And I, in, and, and, you know, I know that you know, the hospital, the high secure psychiatric hospitals are, are well resourced compared to medium secure who are better resourced than low secure who are, and they're all better resourced in general adult uh, services. Yeah. But, but the truth of it is that we are just not spending money on psychological therapists of whatever background um and the and it's we, we don't have enough people to be doing therapy um and the big the the related worry is actually in general adult because of course every year in broadmoor we admit a couple of people who are graduating from general adult services to low secure services to medium secure services and then eventually to high secure services and that's because nobody wants to push in the work the long-term work that's necessary. Um, you need a long time to work with people who are very disabled by childhood trauma and antisocial states of mind. But I think that, I, I, I mean, I, I just, I, I feel that not being able to answer that problem is, is, is our problem as a nation state and not mm. necessarily a human one, because of course the Dutch approach this the, the other way around. They assume that the, res the, the reason for people doing terrible things terrible cruel things that result in injury to other people is some sort of i suppose developmental problem not a psychosis necessarily although they don't rule that out but that fundamentally it's what we would call personality disorders mm -hmm. but i think really the dutch model is thinking more in terms of the, the the idea of complex trauma that these are very complicated going back to the bicycle not analogy, not mm -hmm. analogy very complicated systems of things that affect an individual that cause them to behave that way and because of that the, the necessity is to think in a very, very long term about how this person can be provided with a structured route back into society and normality, or almost reality. And I, I noticed how, you know, how terrible that, I mean, that that's probably a bit harsh. The Dutch aren't very good at coping with psychosis. They don't really have the resources to do it. They sort of offer a slightly different model of, mm -hmm. of their social rehabilitation with medication. Mm -hmm. It's not very effective, but that's by the by because so many people in the Dutch Terva Schekingstelling system are they have a personality disorder. I think it's 80% of the, mm. the have mm. a primary diagnosis of personality disorder opposed to psychosis. Mm. So either because of the way that they cast the problem, or perhaps because of some quirk of the way that people who commit violence in the Netherlands manifest themselves, but I don't really think that's likely. No. They approach it as a long-term problem, which needs a long-term solution. And we don't seem to have that. It seems to be we're always looking for the pill or looking for the psychotherapy that's going to fix people. And that's not, when you, if you really want to understand the dress response, that's not the right approach to take. Yeah, no, well, I, I was very fortunate early on in my career as a forensic psychiatrist to spend time um, in the TBS system and visit a lot of those TBS clinics and work with some lovely Dutch colleagues. And in fact, the International Association of Forensic Psychotherapy, which is 25 this year or something mad like that. Um, I, was there at the, I was there at the first meeting, which is making me feel very old. But that was initially uh, had a lot of, of Dutch colleagues. And what was so interesting to me, even there as a junior forensic psychiatrists and psychotherapists was that they took the mirror image point of view to what the British psychiatrists were saying. So the British psychiatrists would be saying, oh, well, our job is to treat people with psychosis and people with personality disorder are untreatable. Whereas when you go over to Holland, you go across the water and they'd be saying, psychosis, Oh, it's brain disease. You can't do anything about that. What you want to be doing as a psychiatrist is working with personality disorder. And I'm thinking, wow, this is really interesting. And, and, and you know, this is a, a very different approach. And so uh, I was very fortunate to learn a lot from those colleagues and to be and also then, of course, to be skeptical about the models. 
um, and to be uh, and to be open to the idea of using a much broader model. I mean, I feel that one of the things that really helped me as a trainee for a forensic psychiatrist was learning much more about sociology, learning about criminology, mm. being, being aware of other models and ways of thinking about why people break the rules and break the rules in a kind of way that's really cruel and unusual, for want mm. of a better phrase, you know, because they are cruel and they are, they are cruel and unusual. That combination is what tends to mark out the people people who get sent to refer to you and get referred to me I, I, that's a really interesting point that I, I think that an engagement with sociology criminology and and, and actually economics because I remember one of the, uh, the the clinics is run by an economist or was I think he retired about five years ago Henry Witzma who thinks that uh, if you're providing forensic services they should be cost neutral to the taxpayer so the clinic accepts a tiny grant to the government, which covers about 10% of their expenses. And all the rest is made through set, creating and selling things that are made by the clients in the, the, the clinic that they make and services they provide. They fix, or at the time they were fixing computers, they were building forklift trucks. They had a machining system they could do that with. They were doing leather work. They could do soldering, all sorts of, of different things. And that helped to offset the cost of their care. And I, you know, again, we might find this slightly fanciful in the UK because a lot of our clients are very unwell, mentally unwell, you know, psychotic and couldn't maybe handle that kind of work. But at the same time, the idea that this work can fund itself, if you think about it in the right way, is really interesting. And, and you know, whenever you sort of suggest that we need another psychiatrist or psychologist in the service, there's a sort of inward groan from the prison service management or the hospital management, oh, we'll have to think about it as if the resource to make people better was, you know, it's a bad thing to provide this resource or a difficult thing, or it wouldn't sort of cover the costs of maybe have, preventing more victims further down the line. The whole thing's become, I think, a, a sort of a, a battle over resources that should be far more readily available if we thought about these systems as being part of a society where we want to give people skills. We want to, we really want to rehabilitate them. We don't and I, I wonder, and this is absolutely no respect, disrespect to you, Gwen, if the medicalization of these problems early on in the UK has actually served us quite poorly. It's, it's a really interesting question, an entirely reasonable one to, to, to ask. And I, I guess like any technology, it has sort of upsides and downsides. I guess the, the, the advantage of the medicalization of some kinds of distress and particularly, and I'm, I'm very mindful that forensic psychiatry in, in the UK really started with concerns about the mental health of prisoners. Mm. It wasn't so much about deflecting people away from courts or prisons. There was actually about saying there are some seriously mentally unwell people in HMP, Long Latin or whatever it was, and they need help. Um, and I think that that is, I think that was a, an important moment in British psychiatry and the idea that psychiatrists might look after the health of prisoners. Um, and it goes with the whole problem, I think, about mental health, about when is that language of illness helpful and when isn't it because there are clearly ways in which the language can be helpful and clearly ways where mm. it, it isn't and it's partly back to the problem about categories uh, again but i actually think it's a, a it's i think one of the problems is <coughs> an unfortunate nexus um between the um the diagnostic issues and the law <laughs> and this idea about buildings and safety, because I'm very conscious that when Broadmoor was built, you know, in 1863, um, you know, the idea was that you would go there and probably most people would live there for the rest of their lives. The idea it would be an asylum, not for everybody, people did leave Broadmoor, but, but, but there would be a substantial number of people who would live there. And, and as my old boss Murray Cox used to say, if nobody ever left Broadmoor, you'd need more therapists, not less. <laughs> Um, and of course, because of that expectation, there were workshops, there was a kitchen garden, there was a, there was space for people to, it was an old fashioned kind of asylum in that way. So it was sort of more, it had something more akin to a kind of therapeutic community kind mm. of um, um, vision. But of course, in the 1970s, when, you know, uh, and 1980s, you know, when the rise of the anti-psychiatry movement and the closing down of asylums and the, you know, moving things out, I think that psychiatry got there's a there's an unfortunate forensic psychiatry is this unfortunate nexus about something about diagnosis and something about the law you have to have a diagnosis in order for the law to operate 
um, and then to get admitted to the secure place where your risk will be managed. Um, and there's something I think complicated about that, which I haven't really quite formulated myself, but, um, but I do think that there's something still about, about the use of diagnosis, both to get people into hospital um, as opposed to need. I suppose what we see now, I don't know whether you've had this experience, but the experience that I have now is I see people who have committed acts of cruelty um, for which they need help. They, they're distressed, they're disorganized, they need help. But because they don't look acutely mentally unwell, they're distressed, they can't, they can't get any help. And, you know, I have people who are, you know, you know, see, you know, I mean, colleagues will see them who apparently allegedly have some kind of mental health training and will say, you know, this person doesn't have, sorry, Mark, that was me, wasn't it? But, um, they, but they will say this person doesn't have a severe, a severe and enduring mental illness, you know, and, and I'm thinking, what do you mean by that? But of course, what they really mean is I'm a gatekeeper and this service is only for people who look, re who I think look really odd and mad. And this person, these don't fit, these people don't fit. So I'm not, and they're, they're also a bit too much like me, really, for comfort. So, so I'm going to say no to them. And, and it drives me mad. Yeah, to pick, a phrase, a, to pick a phrase at random. <laughs> there's also a horrible tendency, and I'm actually not going to name the disorder. People have to work that out for themselves. But certain types of presentation are people who are constantly seeking help. And this is viewed as a bad way of asking for help by professionals who then yeah. reject the people because they're they're too needy. They, they, they need too much help. So therefore, <laughs> they can't have any help at all. <laughs> it's just... It absolutely, yes. you know, drives me to the point yeah. of distraction when I see that. So what we'll do is we'll just wait for Gwen to rejoin us and uh, then we'll kick our conversation back off uh, where I where I lost it. Uh, I said, in the meantime, let me have a go at some of the, the, the questions that I can actually answer without Gwen's help. So one of the first questions that we had was, can you train in forensic psychotherapy despite not doing your bachelor's degree in anything medicine or psychology related? Uh, the answer to that is absolutely yes, you can. You just need to do your clinical training in psychotherapy, which you could do through any of the organizations that offer it, such as the, um, oh, hello again, Gwen, the British Psychotherapy Foundation. And then you just need to do your placements in forensic settings to try and get a bit more experience. And that will be fine. Gwen, you were mid-flow when we were cut off, but I was so <laughs> confused that I completely lost my place. <laughs> I think it, it no, was no. about medical gatekeepers, but we, we, we have a choice now. Yeah, we. I. I. No, we were saying. I. I was. What I was going to say. Um. Not. Perhaps not terribly coherently. Perhaps that why cut out. But what I was going to say is that I do think that not just in, in mental health, but in general medical settings, I think a lot of people feel that their task is to say no. And yeah. I would like very much yeah. to see a time again when we say we start to say yes. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. And on, on, on the spirit of inclusivity and uh, <laughs> that, that sound, I wonder if we should have a look at some of the questions in the chat, some of which I thought were uh, really interesting ones for us to, mm. to have a look at. Um, there's a question from Pippa, which I liked. It says, how do you measure success? I think in, in forensic psychotherapy, other than by the absence of recidivism. And is there a time scale for the measurement of success? Oh, that is a fantastic question. Um, and you're absolutely right, Pippa, that um, recidivism or absence thereof is not particularly helpful. I mean, it's, it's, it's obviously important to consider, but I, I think that we, we think, I, and I don't know whether you would agree with me, Mark, but I think that probably before you get anywhere near recidivism, recidivism is more likely if you have per, a, a, a person who is beginning to take themselves seriously as a human being who begins to see themselves as someone who has value, who can belong. And we know that people who feel socially disconnected are more risky. We know that people who feel that nobody cares about them and that nothing matters anymore, that these are people, these are risky states of mind. So the best kind of evidence that we have about desistance, which is really important for recidivism, is the idea that I'm, I can make a difference to my own mind and to my own life. And that what I say, what I do or believe or feel about myself and others matters. Um, and, that, and that process of getting people to that point can take some time. And the other associated question to Pippa's very interesting question of how much of that do you need to be in custody for? 
um, that actually could you start this work in conditions of custody but continue it in less custodial settings? I, I think that's a wonderful answer, Gwen. I, I think having worked with life prisoners with extremely long tariffs as well, where realistically there is no hope of, of, of release, uh, it's very, I think there's still a, a need for us to work with people where rehabilitation honestly isn't really on the cards and try and help them to find some meaning and, and purpose in their lives as well, even if that will be in prison. Um, and I think, you know, we had a, a, a partner service that you may be aware of, I'm not going to name it just in case, but that was set up in prison with a very much a trauma centered model. And I think that because that maybe was quite germinal when we started out, there were a lot of men who started to relive some of their trauma. And then there was a, a spate of very tragic suicides in the same service all within a year there was an inquiry things like that and I think that spoke to the need if you're going to start this work to have a framework by which you can finish it by which you can ensure that people will have a continued space to think and talk about their their trauma and how it's affected them um, and try and sort of integrate that understanding into their lives to, to, to be more I guess feel more completed or feel that they can live without just being a victim of that trauma um, uh, we could say more, I'm sure, but I, I should probably <laughs> move on. Um, somebody asked, which we can answer very quickly, as a psychotherapist, do you get therapy yourself as part of the job? Do you still um, do psychotherapy? Well, do, do I still? I don't, I don't have therapy anymore, but I would do if I felt I needed it. Um, I haven't had therapy myself for a while, but I'm in regular supervision, but mainly peer supervision with others. Mm. Um, and, um, and that taking time out for reflection and thinking about what I'm not thinking about um, is an important part of continuing professional development. Yeah, when, when you're training, it is absolutely crucial as well, be a requirement of, of most courses. I remember one friend of ours, colleague friend of ours, telling me about driving across London to go to their therapist, having done a 12 hour shift at the hospital, just sleeping through the entire 50 minutes of the session. So even when you have lots of commitments, the therapy is viewed as absolutely uh, essential uh, part mm. of that. Um, uh, it is what, it is very important and i've had three different kind lots of therapy across my working lifetime and they've all been very different and for very and but helped me in different ways absolutely and i i had to <laughs> pause my therapy a couple of years ago due to the birth of my second child and the ability mm. to find space but i regret it and i would love to be able to restart it whenever my mm children uh, permit me so probably about 18 years or so um we've had a couple of questions to the effect of do we think that violent acts are possible without any form of trauma or is trauma an essential part of violence oh no i i don't i i, I don't think that trauma childhood trauma in particular no i don't think it's essential uh, i think it is i think in the in the samples and populations that mark and i work in i think it's very rare to find people who haven't had experiences of childhood trauma but in the world that i work in a maximum security psychiatric hospital we do get very rarely it doesn't happen very often we do occasionally get people who have apparently no childhood trauma no previous psychiatric illness and no criminality who gripped by an acute onset of serious mental disorder a bit like the chap you were describing um just you know become you know sort of destructive worlds of destruction in their own right and do dreadful things and that and that is very sad and but i think in the general prison system of course you do see people who commit acts of cruelty and violence uh, for instrumental gain um, um, in the ordinary way. And of course, you know, great acts of violence are committed in the name of political, political power and organization. Um, when I'm giving talks about this, I nearly always end up showing a picture of the men at the Vance conference, um, who probably never laid a hand on a person in their lives, but orchestrated mm. the deaths of millions of people. So, and I think that it's important to bear those kinds of structural violence in mind as well. Thank you, Gwen. I think we've probably got time for one more question and then we should we should hand, hand back over to our chair. And I'm just going to end with the, a, a question about broader ideas around the, the work that we've been involved in. And the question is, how do we feel about the rise of true crime media? And do you think this sort of this because uh, it is I mean, you know, I'm never short of speaking invitations and actually tend to decline a few of them and some of my colleagues don't they have now careers as speaking about true crime and, and forensic psychology. Do you think this visibility and I, I hesitate to say fetishization but maybe I shouldn't be hesitating with true crime has an effect on how people view um, 
uh, crime and, and deviance and, and uh, I guess mental disorder as well, more broadly? Well, I, I guess, you know, I, I, I would come back to this idea that um, that we have a new tech, we have various kinds of new technology here. And as always, a technology can be used for good or ill. And, you know, I'm willing to bet that you, Mark, uh, as I did, thought about writing because we wanted to communicate something important about the work that we do. And because we know that it's a subject that nearly everybody's interested in, there isn't a person on the planet who's not interested in good and evil, you know, death and judgment, you know, the four last things, you know, um, and we're, we're all interested. In. So that's a good thing for everybody to be interested in. I think that is a good thing. But I guess my anxiety is always a little bit about the the risk of monstering others and a kind of salacious um, interest um, and it was something that I know that you worked hard in your book uh, and we certainly worked hard in our book to to make to make it clear that we were really not interested in a kind of salacious description of people's cruelty or violence that it's a this is a somber and sober topic to take seriously um, if we want things to get better. Mm. Thank you, Gwen. It's been a, a real pleasure talking to you. Um, I'm sorry we didn't have more time, and I'm particularly sorry to all those of you who asked such great questions, and we mm. haven't had a chance to to get through to them. But we were we have unfortunately reached the end of our, our hour long discussion, um, and I, I'm going to hand this back to Ruth now just to, to say thank you, Gwen, for such a, a fascinating talk, and I hope you all uh, enjoyed it. I did. Thank you so much, Mark. Thank you, Mark, Gwen, what a fantastic discussion. Um, absolutely riveting. And thank you for persevering despite the technical hitch in the middle. Uh, clearly consummate uh, professionals, both of you. I'm sure many of our attendees tonight will be keen to get hold of copies of your books. Uh, signed book plate copies are available from Fox Lane Books and you'll see the details of this in the chat box. If you've enjoyed tonight's event, you may be interested in another talk that we have coming up entitled what we can learn from the slow epidemic of dementia, in which we reflect on how research into dementia over the last decades and increasing awareness of this disorder has developed in the context of the current challenges of the pandemic and climate change. We hope some of you can join us for that on Wednesday the 1st of December at 1pm in the John Curry Room, Biology Building, Campus West, University of York. So all that remains for me now is to say thank you for joining us. And please remember that this talk will be available on YouTube in the coming days, and you will receive an email to notify you of that. Thank you again, and good night.